Welcome to our TV debate Balkan in Europe. I'm Borian Jovanovski. And I'm Ivana Dragicevic. The European Commission, supported by the Council of Ministers, announced its new strategy for enlargement three years ago. In the heart of this strategy is the rule of law as the basis upon which the European values are built. Montenegro is negotiating, Serbia is starting its negotiations, Macedonia has received six recommendations to start its negotiations. And two decades after Dayton Peace Accord, EU have finally approved stabilization and association agreement for Bosnia and Herzegovina. According to the situation on the ground, the announced and decisive action of the European Commission to provide for the rule of law for now has no evident results. In some countries like Macedonia, things have gotten worse. How is the European Commission implementing its new strategy? Are the invested finance in the reforms in the area of the rule of law accompanied by the true political will in the or in order to reach the expected results. And have the geostrategic interests put aside basic European values in this region? These are the questions in today's edition of Balkan in Europe, which we begin with a short analysis prepared by European Fund for the Balkans on what is happening in the area on the reforms of the rule of law. Vladavina prava ključna je na putu evropskih integracija. U studiji Evropskog fonda za Balkan o održivosti borbe protiv korupcije ističu se tri ključne elementa u kojima su reforme nužne. Svaka od zemalja Zapadnog Balkana na različitoj stepenici puta k Evropskoj uniji. Ključne preporuke studije za pojedine su zemlje. Srbija osigurati potpunu neovisnost pravo suđa uvjete za rad antikorupcijskih tijela, donijeti zakone i osigurati im kontrolne mehanizme. Za BiH hitno usvajanje antikorupcijske strategije, jačanje institucija te provođenje mjera kazne za korumpirane dužnostnike. Prva preporuka za Crnu Goru je zdonjeti presude za korupciju na najvišoj razini. U Makedoniji su vidljivi samo pomaci Dona. Today with us in the studio of the European Parliament discussing on this topic is Mr. Knut Fleckenstein, member of European Parliament from the group of European Socialists, and Mr. David L. Uh, McAllister, member of the European Parliament from the European People Party. And our expert today is Mr. Nikola Dimitrov from the Hague Institute for Global Justice. And I will kind of start with you, Mr. Dimitrov. So, uh, Huge, huge amounts of money have been invested in uh, all these years in the region of Western Balkans, in all the countries. The Dutch government was one of the governments in Europe which was very uh, hard on stance that these basic principles have to be uh, 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 supported to go further in the negotiations process. So what happened? You know, did it, all this money went in vain? After all this year, because we see progress reports, there is some progress. Feel free to join us in this debate. But. Thank you, first of all, for this opportunity. As you underlined in the announcement, on paper, it looks good. Mm -hmm. Croatia joined, Montenegro started, opening chapters. Serbia is almost there, hoping to open chapters in the second half of this year. Albania got a candidate status last year, so things are moving. But then once you dig in deeper, in terms of outcome and impact made, we face the difficult questions. And if you look at the progress report of last year, it's full of uh, far-reaching judicial reforms are still to be made in most of the enlargement countries. Uh, corruption is still quite a serious concern in most of the enlargement countries. Fight against organized crime is significant it's a significant issue. In the wording of the Commission, this means these are still the big issues. I think um, you can't really achieve democratic transformation with bureaucratic means. Mm -hmm. You can't really ask for laws only, the input side, let's say adoption of the anti-corruption law, without uh, looking at the output. Transparency International Index is following uh, politically sensitive cases. It will take a bit of a more hands-on approach for Europe to really make a difference, that's one. And second, uh, a bit more honesty on the side of political will. Incentive is an important part of this game, and that weakens because the light at the end of the tunnel is a bit further now. No enlargement, domestic politics dominate. If Europe really wants to make a difference in the region, and if it cannot make a difference in the Balkans, I don't think it can make a difference anywhere else, 
it's, I think, a last chance for Europe to really show that it can do and make things. Then um, it will have to readjust in a way. And I'm somewhat hopeful with the signals that the progress reports of the Commission will be a bit more measurable mm -hmm. and more output oriented. Uh, so Anna, let's go country by country. Yes, case just one case. short yeah. question. Uh, mm -hmm. Our two members of parliament were recently, Serbia, you're both uh, very engaged in the area of Western Balkans. So we heard the, this uh, sentence, lack of political will. So do you trust politicians? Because we see after all these years, rule of law is not on that kind of status it could have been. The European Community and the European Union are clearly committed that the states in the Western Balkans have a clear European perspective. All 28 member states have declared this. And even though we won't see new member states joining the European Union within the next few years, I do believe that enlargement policy is a key transformational force to foster democracy and to foster economic liberalization among those countries who want to join us. Mm -hmm. And that's why we should have a closer look at each single state in the Western Balkans. They're very different and judge what they're doing and try and help them make their way towards the European Union. Me as the Rapporteur for Serbia, I strongly believe Serbia is on its way to the European Union. It will be a long way, it won't be an easy way, but if Serbia could join the European Union one of these days, it would be a big value not only for Serbia, but for all of us in the European Union. Well, uh, the biggest political crisis in the region right now is in Macedonia, and it's related exactly with the, with the rule of law. The crisis in Macedonia is a revelation of the wire, wire taping, huge wire taping uh, uh, operation providing evidence of alleged corruption by the high-ranking uh, member of the government, including the prime minister. The reaction from the EU to this uh, latest crisis has been very limited from, from an uh, expression of a, a serious concern to a call for a, a independent investigation. Uh, this statement gave the impression, and I will quote uh, former ambassador uh, in, of, of EU in Macedonia, Mr. Ervan Fuere, that the that the EU seemed out of touch with reality on the ground, in addition to being inconsistent with the findings of the progress report, which had itself raised concerns over the independence of the judi judicial process. What do you think, Mr. Uh, Fleckerstein? Why EU is so cautious? I mean, there is a, a European Commission, Council of Ministers, just observing, and we had an impression that the high-ranking EU officials are, you know, in, in, in a way, they're trying to, to hide maybe their unsu unsuccessful strategy uh, in regards of Macedonia integration, uh, European integration processes. Mm. I don't know why they react so in, in the Commission and in, in the Council. Maybe one reason is bad conscience. Because, because of the unsuccessful of strategy. Yeah, the, nah, the unsuccessful strategy and, and the long time waiting, waiting and not listening to this parliament and our recommendation to start uh, negotiations and so on. So this all leads after a long period maybe to the situation that especially this government steps goes backwards and not forward. But uh, secondly, of course, always at the beginning, when you have such a scandal, you first want to see uh, what's really going on. And uh, then I guess the reaction from the Commission will be clear and uh, I wait for it. Uh, Mr. Uh, McAllister, some say that the Greek uh, veto is the reason of this failure of the reform processes. Do you think that uh, such a big failure is we can discover on the wiretaping wire, wire uh, phone conversation uh, could be due to the Greek veto in the Council of Ministers to, for, for the, the, to, to, to start the negotiation with Macedonia. And I'm asking you as a member of European People Party, uh, having in mind uh, that your, your political group is strangely silent about the democratic capacity of the government run by the sister party, Vemero, the Pomene. Well, unlike Mr. Fleckenstein, who has been to Macedonia now negotiating with the political parties, I'm not an expert. 
Uh, but um, I know from uh, talks with Edward Kukan, who is uh, the shadow rapporteur for my political group uh, on Macedonia, that apart from a lot of differences between the government and the opposition, and apart from allegations which clearly have to be uh, solved, um, I think in general we would like to see the government and the opposition cooperate more in general questions. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea that the opposition isn't going to Parliament. The opposition should go to Parliament in Skopje and fight for their politics, fight for their vision of a better Macedonia and try and make things better. And in the general question of EU membership, we need a united government and opposition. We, we, we so I, I, from, from the various uh, EU institutions, but again, my question, why EPP is so silent about the very questionable uh, democratic performance of the of the government run by the sister party of EPP. No, no, we're not silent. We speak to our friends from Macedonia in a very open and clear way. We do that behind uh, closed doors. But it's not a, a party political question in this case. It's that we have Macedonia as an important country in the Western Balkans with a clear European perspective, and we want Macedonia to make progress. I know that it's not easy for Macedonia because Greece is always blocking a further progress because of the name issue. We will have to solve the name issue. That's the only way to get a unanimous vote among the 28 member states. But in the meantime, there's a lot of things we can do, uh, bringing Macedonia forward to one of these days starting to negotiate. Ivan, let's Maybe. use the experience of the Dimitrov uh, from Please, Macedonia. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're... Maybe it is another reason as well. And it's not dependent <clears throat> on your party, my party also. Some of us dealing with, for example, Macedonia mm -hmm. for a long time are a bit in love with this country and they want to see it closer to the uh, EU than uh, the reality shows what is possible. And they make the mistake not to mention, not to name the real problems and also to, get a, to go and fight with, with the government if necessary because I think we help them only if we really name the problems and say what we see and not what we feel and what we hope. Maybe just a short, not to stay on the Macedonia whole program, uh, how do you see this really deadlock? We've, we see it both in, you know, two integration processes going on with the EU and with the NATO in Macedonia. And does, you know, Brussels understand the, the, the difficulties on the ground? I, I really think that we need an honest recognition on the part of Brussels, all of the institutions and the member states, that Macedonia is no longer a functional democracy. And the crisis is not a political fight of the two big political blocs in Macedonia. That's a symptom. What the real crisis is, is a fundamental erosion of the institutions. You have a routine political interference in the work of the courts. You have the public prosecutor being instructed. This is if these tapes are true, and so far I find very little to think otherwise. You have the public revenue office or building inspectorates or social inspectorates being used to target private companies for political reasons. So Macedonia is some sort of a soft dictatorship, even though that's a harsh word. We have to recognize that. And we have to start the healing process. And I don't think we will get somewhere without political responsibility. Of, and I think we have enough to have that. The second is the moral responsibility of Europe, which, which had allowed for the door to be closed for too long. We've been left in a limbo. Macedonia has been left in a limbo for a number of years. Six positive recommendations by, by the Commission, not followed up at the level of the Council. I don't think we would have reached this tragedy had the door been open. And that's why we need, once Macedonia is back on its knees, we need to be freed from the Greek grip. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Serbia now. Of, of course, to Serbia. You've been a reporter for Serbia. We know how the progress report looks like. Once again, my question is, both for both of you, uh, do you trust Prime Minister Vucic that he will do the necessary reforms, that they will deliver action plans needed for the start of the negotiations on chapters 23 and 24? Yes, I trust the Prime Minister, and I'm full of respect for 
the progress the country has done in the last few years, not only under his government, but also under the government of Mr. Dacic. Um, Serbia has a clear pro-European orientation. To become a member of the European Union is one of the most important goals, perhaps even the most important goal of the Serbian government. The screening process has now been completed mm -hmm. and now it's up to the Council to decide whether the first chapter or even the first chapters could be opened in this year. And I have a quite clear position. I think that Serbia should be awarded. I think the reform process should be acknowledged here in Brussels. And I think 2015 should be the year where the first chapter or even the first chapters can be opened. But once again, we won't decide that in the parliament. It's up to the council. Of course, uh, there is a strategy called, you called it, I think, this fundamentals first, that these things need to be respected and uh, done uh, here to, to work on other things. Uh, rule of law, corruption, all these things that are inside uh, of these two very difficult chapters that, for example, Croatia went through at the end of its process are now ahead of Serbia, but both are kind of uh, precognitioned uh, with uh, uh, talks to Pristina, to Kosovo. So how do you see this will evolve? Because we know in the mandate of this commission there, will, there won't be further enlargement. Well, if we would wait until everything is fulfilled on that field, I think we can wait for a long, long time. And we should reduce it a bit to realistic uh, measures. Uh, there should be not only uh, in writing nice laws, but at least they should have started to implement real, uh, the new laws as well. And uh, then I think they need more time because having such a, a better situation on, on rule of law, uh, independent judiciary, uh, fight against corruption. You need brave politicians, but you need also a change in society, and that needs some time, I think. So we should not say everything has to be perfect on that field, then we can start. Okay, then I will not see any start because I'm already 60 and a bit. But we have to see the, the realistic <coughs> will and the start of implementation, and that is I think what is the reason why it didn't work out until now. Oh, yeah. Enlargement is a key transformational force and transformation means change and change needs time. Mm -hmm. But I think Serbia is really catching up. I mean Serbia lost a lot of years uh, under the dark days uh, under the Milosevic regime and they're now catching up. I think the new approach of the European Union is good, fundamentals first. We're talking about chapter 23 and 24 to be opened at the very early stage and they will also be closed at a very final stage. And of course we've got chapter 35 with the special relationships between Serbia and Kosovo which will then have to be ruled. Let me just make one more argument. I think the European Union is clever to follow a more for more and less for less strategy. Mm -hmm. If a country does well it should be acknowledged and awarded and so new chapters can be opened. And if a country does less if they're going one step forward and two uh, steps backwards, then chapters shouldn't be opened or other chapters shouldn't be closed. So it's really in the hand of the candidate country to make progress. And once again, I see a large majority in the European Parliament, in the Commission and in the Council for the new member states in the Balkans to come. About, about the, yeah. yeah. Just on this point on implementation, we, the Dutch have a saying, they say paper is patient. Mm -hmm. We've done a questionnaire, we're doing a study on the criminal justice chains for all the countries at my institute. And a Serbian practitioner said, look, there is the law and then there is reality. Mm -hmm. The implementation gap is really the biggest issue in this field of rule of law throughout the region. And first of all, it's really difficult to assess impact. The commission this year will try to combine different indexes, Transparency International, rule of law index, the World Economic Forum, independent justice. It's not easy. So things are moving on this side. But I would like to endorse your point. It's not only up to the politicians as well. We have to make the cultural jump and we need to focus on the agents of, chain, of, of change, which are not only the political parties. 
Those are Another the professionals, yeah. civil society. Just a question related to the Mr. Flickerson uh, uh, answer about the brave politician and the leadership. Uh, Dimitrov, you, uh, you, you used to work with the Prime Minister Nikola Dimitrov. There are many rumors in the region about the similarity uh, between uh, uh, Nikola Gruevski and uh, Prime Minister of Serbia Vucic and their populist tendencies. So, briefly, your comment? I think in the region we have tried several times, maybe one, one time too many, with strong leaders. I think what, what we really need in the Balkans is strong institutions. Uh, do you think that overall uh, security situation, which is now uh, facing Europe with Ukraine crisis, with Middle East, all these things kind of put the focus on this region? Uh, again, and you know, will the, the security be a top of, of the European values because of that in this process? Well, security is always or was always an, also an important point, but uh, I don't see that now something is in addition, uh, something has changed in that. Uh, I would not put that together. Yeah, but we now have uh, renewed efforts on Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have Hammenstein Meyer Initiative. Uh, we saw Commissioners Hahn and High Representative Mogherini going in and out of the region I think very often. This is they more are a more result present. of this very unfortunately uh, done uh, by the President of the Commission at the beginning, saying that in the next five years nothing will happen and so on. Oh, well. but it he won't, didn't mean basically. it. And, and <laughs> meanwhile, we know uh, well, that it is a technic point of view. But now to show, no, no, we are willing, there's no empathy, we, we, we are willing to continue the process. I'll have to disagree with my respected colleague on this question. Hallelujah. Jean-Claude <laughs> Juncker really just said common sense uh, at his no, inaugural speech. In, no, no, common sense, no. because he said in the next years there won't be new members no. of the European Union, and that's pretty obvious. Yeah. But he also was very clear that the countries of the Western Balkans have a European perspective, and we're working on this okay. issue day by day. Let me just make one point. Chapter 31 requires that candidate countries align the foreign and security policy with, with that of the European Union until they become member. And we see a lot of common ground in foreign policy between the European Union and Serbia. However, we do see a few points, for instance, how to treat uh, Russia, but there are still differences. So I do hope that Serbia will use the time in the next years to also align itself on this ground. About the, about the political will, when there is a clear political will, we can clearly see the so-called EU soft power. And it's a case of Croatia and a case of the fighting efficient fight of the, of, of the corruption. It seems that we are missing, that we can't see this political will in the, in the Western Balkans country. And maybe this, uh, this failure of the reform process is directly, uh, direct consequences of the lack of the political will for faster integration of the Western Balkans country in the European Union. But I wouldn't you agree. I wouldn't look at all the Western Balkans from the same angle. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to differentiate. For instance, Serbia has a strong impetus in fighting corruption. Mm -hmm. I mean, the progress report from the Commission is very clear on this question. Serbia has other homework to do. But I don't think you can compare the situation on corruption in Serbia with, for instance, Kosovo or other countries. Are you satisfied with the so-called, uh, the, the, the effects of so-called EU soft power in, 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 when we are talking about the reform process in the Western Balkans? Well, some things are going well, and other things, certain countries like Serbia still have their homework to do. I mean, I think the most important questions uh, in, um, uh, in Serbia is to reform the public administration, to do economic reforms, the independence of the judiciary, to battle corruption on all levels. I think that's where there's still a lot to do. But once again, if you look at other things, uh, Serbia is doing quite well, for instance, in fighting organized crime. Mr. Flegerson, are you I, satisfied with the EU soft power effects? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I am, because I don't know a better way. But uh, maybe we have to rethink a bit our common policy. On the one hand side, we say states need a lot of time to change also society and, and, and so on. 
On the other hand, we say more for more. I don't like it personally so much because it looks a bit, if you are brave, you get a bit more chocolate. If you are not, no, no, it's not about that. It's about transforming my own country in a country where I want to live with freedom, with independent judiciary and so on. It's not to do Mr. Juncker or Mr. McAllister or me a favor. And, and knowing this and knowing that we need maybe some more time, the question is how to, to bind European Union and show that we are really engaged in infrastructure uh, measures and so on. Whether we should have something which is not directly bound to, to the progress, but to the whole procedure that we stick together and, and, and try. And if we need some more time, we need some more time. But the Mr. Dimitrov, all the countries of the Western Balkans are on this and that level inside the integration process uh, with the European Union. But basically, concerning all the uh, things that this analysis showed, uh, we really have still very unstable institutions. We have Bosnia and Herzegovina as this uh, case in the middle of it. So uh, uh, do you trust the words that we hear of kind of optimism here? I think the accession process only works if it's really merit-based. So any politicization, which is usually used for political cover to do something or not to do something, completely undermines the whole mechanism and then it doesn't work. And the most drastic example is the case of Macedonia with the name mm -hmm. issue, with the Greek bloc. Mm -hmm. Serbia will reach that danger once they get close to the what we euphemistically call the normalization of the relations with, with Kosovo. Kosovo. Once the political price of that move is equal or higher than the price of doing reforms and delivering on the mainstream political goals, then Serbia will face a political obstacle as well, and it will be in danger. For, for Bosnia, I think this was a good initiative. It's really high time for them to, to move forward. And the real transformative effect actually starts once you start the accession talks. Because it is then that the Commission is deeply involved on a daily basis with the work of the national administrations. And what we have done, out of political reasons in the EU member states, is we have front-loaded all these difficult preconditions before the accession process. So Macedonia has been there for a long time, Bosnia has been there for a long time. We don't want to have dates once uh, in advance. We don't want to know when these countries will accede. But we need to start accession talks soon with all of them to actually have the real impact. Uh, we have a rare opportunity to talk with the two politicians from Germany, from the two biggest political party. And uh, we would like to ask you about the uh, Berlin conference, which took place last um, summer, should uh, continue in June in Vienna. What, uh, so far, what are the concrete results out, out of this conference? Or, or because we have an impression that it's a kind of, you know, uh, event to, 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 to keep the momentum of the, pro, uh, of the positive rhetoric about the enlargement. Could we expect some concrete results of, uh, out of this initiative in a foreseeable future? Quite frank, I don't know. I know that this uh, conference in Berlin was an important signal to show we go on. We really are engaged. And uh, this is the worth for itself, but not enough for, for a long period, I agree. Now I, I, I think a lot of people are thinking about projects, infrastructure projects, and, and uh, also on uh, the enlargement policy on the several uh, de, sorry on, on several steps and I'm very uh, interested to hear what uh, in Vienna the outcome will be and then I think we should come together and then we know whether it's worthwhile or whether it was a useful show I actually had the possibility of taking part in the Berlin conference uh, last year. I think the conference was a success and yeah. I would like to underline uh, what Mr. Fleckenstein said. This Berlin conference 
since it took place in Berlin is another proof that the federal government under Chancellor Angela Merkel and her foreign minister Frank-Walter Steinmeier have identified the Balkans as a very important region not only for European but also for national German foreign policy and despite all the troubles we have in our southern neighborhood and despite all the troubles we have in our eastern neighborhood, we must always bear in mind that the Balkans are in the heart of Europe and that it's not only in the interest of the Balkan countries, but it's in the interest of all of us in Europe that the process of reconciliation and cooperation goes on. And that's why I'm very happy that the next conference will take place in Vienna and that we can have a new impetus which can now be carried on. I think this shows that the Balkans are not only of interest south of the Alp Mountains, but also north. Time flies by very yeah. fast. Yeah. Half an hour is finished. Thank you very much for being our guests. Poštovani gledatelji, pratili ste emisiju Balkan u Evropi, studija Evropskog parlamenta u Briselu. Doviđenja. Doviđenja, vidimo se u Juno. Doviđenja.